Um, and there was a study a few years ago called the Great British Class Survey that sort of updated the idea of upper, middle and working class uh, to suit modern Britain. And it is different and it's more fragmented these days, I think, which creates a much more interesting, uh, for me at least from a fiction perspective, way of moving into these stories and looking at different people from different backgrounds coming together. I'm really interested in how um, the finance industry is one example, but these sorts of new jobs that we have um, at the moment that are in the quaternary sector of the economy, how they provide opportunities and catalysts for a story like the narrators to happen, people to come from different backgrounds and suddenly, by uh, virtue of their education and employment, have access to some of these old, um, very exclusive spaces. I think sometimes there's an impulse for fiction to show the way to something or um, make a grand statement, I suppose. I'm really interested in this moment of flux we're in right now where the old, I think, guarantees to the class system that the race, as it was constructed quite explicitly a couple hundred years ago to, to provide these guarantees, they're sort of being eroded by the evolution of capitalism. Uh, what's the future of that? I don't know. <laughs> But from a fiction perspective and as a novelist, it was a really exciting moment, I think, to try and capture, hopefully, in this story. There's a scene in the second novel where uh, Connell, one of the protagonists, goes to a literary reading. Um, and he feels incredibly alienated from what he sees. He feels that writers turn up to uh, events full of people from a particular class with a particular educational background and um, essentially the writer sells them the product which is cultured existence in the form of a commodity and the commodity is a book and people can purchase this book and therefore purchase their way into a seemingly cultured class um, and that all of the money that changes hands in the book industry is actually just people, people paying to belong to a class of people who read books. Um, yeah, and that is something that I, that I definitely f worry about and feel um, implicated in because I do think a huge amount of the cultural world, first of all, that there is a large extent to which it involves sealing off the appointed cultural producers from normal life by saying, like by, you know, festivals and <laughs> events and um, like dinner parties and book launches um, that this that this world that the economic and cultural backing of this world is a way of taking writers from their background whatever it may be and and making them part of a special class which is somewhat fenced off from like normal life as it proceeds in the outside world um, I don't, I, I, and I'm very sceptical of that process, and I'm very sceptical of the way in which books are marketed as commodities, like almost like accessories which people can fill their homes with, like beautiful items that you can fill your shelves with and therefore become a sort of book person. Um, I guess the reason that I feel sceptical of all that is because it makes me feel that books have no potential to speak truth to power. They have no, they have no potential as political um, texts because of the role they play in the in the culture economy. That's already predetermined how people are going to read them. So even if the book is full of Marxist propaganda, it's still sealed off from any real political uh, potential because of its position as a commodity in this, in this market. I write a lot about social class, um, but I don't think there's a straightforward way of doing that. I mean, I guess you could say, um, that, that the idea of a Marxist novel probably has to do with writing about, um, you know, working class characters. And certainly that is one approach to, the, to a socialist novel. Um, and I think it's, 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 obviously, it's obviously very important, but it also raises important questions about what do we understand the working class to mean. The people that I write about um, tend to be kind of precariously situated in the economy. Um, like they're usually college educated, like I am, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are financially stable or secure. Um, and again, I mean, that just goes back to writing about this, the world that I encountered when I came out of college, when I had enough of a developed brain to notice what I was seeing around me. Those were the only tools, the only material that I could draw on to make sense of, um, to use in a, in a book. So it's difficult for me to try and, um, 
to try and make sense of the way that I approach social class in my books and the way that I try to approach it in my in my life like in my critical or analytical life um, but it is something that's very important to me and I think what's what's really important and sort of the best I can do is to try and um, observe how class as a very broad social structure impacts our personal and intimate lives like how do we carry material realities and economic realities into our interpersonal relationships and one way is through commodities. If I've done anything I've created a genre of writing which I think is like sort of um, I would call kind of post-industrial adjustment and it's about people who are adjusting to a whole different way of life and adjusting to the change in society from a capitalist society into a conceptualist society where you don't make physical goods and physical goods are made at zero cost so there's not a wage economy and um, you're having to sort of think we're also living in this era where machines and automation are, are, are replacing us robots are replacing us so there's an existential crisis of kind of what are we here for what's the purpose of us and this is a, a question that humanity faces and um, you know, the, the first people that experienced that were the industrial working classes because they were the first victims of that, that, that whole technological change. Um, and that's what I'm writing about. That's what I'm writing about people's reaction to the, their kind of um, emotional and physical redundancy. As, you know, our, you know, as what we're doing as a species. And I think that's why, that's why the kind of um, the book has, has, has resonated for so long, or, or the writing in general has resonated for so long, because it's about transition. It's about that kind of transition. And um, it's not a book about kind of um, a middle class couple going to Tuscany and, and falling in love and falling out of love, which is a kind of standard kind of, um, you know, the standard kind of um, English literature kind of fair, basically. Um, which is, you know, <coughs> which is the stuff that's kind of held as kind of great life-affirming writing. Um, I like to think that I'm kind of hunting bigger game than that, and I'm looking at I'm looking at something that's much more sort of um, resonant and crucial to people's lives today. I think I'm inspired by many different things, and I think when I look across all of my work, what unites it is I'm always thinking about queerness from a working class point of view. I think that's a very underserved place in literature. Often when we read about queer characters, it's from a middle class or an upper middle class. I think about how formative, uh, you know, Maurice and E.M. Forster or even Giovanni's room was for me, but it didn't necessarily come from the same socioeconomic background that, that I write from. A lot of the book in English is actually written using a Glaswegian dialect or written in broad Scots. And language plays a really important role in the book, as does clothing, as does a lot of different things. Because Agnes, the main character of the book, rejects the, the native tongue of her neighbours and her family and the people around her. And she speaks almost like a newscaster. She has this projected accent, which is because she is a product of a class system in the UK that tells you that regional accents are wrong and that we should all speak like the Queen and we should all aspire to, to rise to the middle class. And Agnes falls for it or she's, she's affected by that. Um, but language in that way actually increases her isolation because the people around her see her and think, who does she think she is? You know, why is she talking like that? And then, of course, human nature follows because when you see someone projecting airs and graces, you then very quickly want to sort of pull at them and say, why do you think you're so special? And so it's all a bit of a pride and shame as a little bit of a trap for Agnes. But clothing also plays a really important role. You know, one of the cliches I find in working class uh, let's call it media, whether that's cinema or, or literature, is sometimes we think when people are poor that it can be a bit grubby or it can be a bit dirty. And I never knew that. I always knew the, the actual opposite of that. You know, growing up, the mothers around me would never allow their kids to go over the door without looking immaculate. And that was, you might not be able to afford many clothes, but you were always cleaner than a whistle. Um, and it was saying the truth about the house. And there was an awful lot of pride in that. And sometimes as a kid, it was annoying because your mother was always at you to sort of tidy yourself up. But she was she was trying to project something to the world. She was trying to hide 
um, you know, maybe the hunger or the fact we couldn't pay our bills or that there was trouble at home. And I wanted to play on that with the book. I wanted to really make Agnes the archetype of that type of character because she is a woman who, no matter what happens to her, will never go over the front door without looking like a film star, without looking her very best. And it, it bristles a lot of the other women around her. It causes some problems for her. But I think working class pride is, um, is really a superpower. I was walking down the street one day. I wasn't thinking anything. I'm minding my business, walking down the street, and then I see the chauffeurs, and then I saw the, the executives, and I thought, wow, what is it like? You know, there's two very different worlds, you know, working class immigrant, rich, you know, executive on the Upper East Side. What is it like when they come together? And that was it, you know, it was a very basic idea. Um, but I started writing it and I started moving into their families and their wives and their children. Um, I was very fascinated by both sides. I was very fascinated by this Wall Street executive, you know, what is his struggles? And his wife, who is a socialite, what is her struggles? Because I know the other immigrant side more. I know what it's like to be an immigrant in New York City because I've been an immigrant in New York City. I am an immigrant in New York City. Uh, but you know, I, I, I wanted to explore, you know, the ways in which um, the same situation, the recession, how we affected them and how, um, and, and how they each, you know, there's a lot of tension between the families at certain points and how, you know, they have powers over each other and how they use that power over each other and within their marriages, how they use the power within, um, within their marriages and also their dreams, because they each have dreams, right? The, the working class immigrant family has its dreams of this American life, this American dream life, and they, the rich family has this, you know, really good life on paper. They have nice house, they have, summer vacation home and their dream is to see their children grow up happy and successful and every family is you know trying in their own way and then they clash and then things fall apart in certain ways so it's you know it's for me, for me it was a story about people each with their own dreams and doing the best that they can and making poor choices but that at the end they all wanted simple things which is happiness you know it's very much about I just want to be happy and I'm trying to do all this like they're all humans, right? They're all humans. I think that for me, what I learned is that behind all this, behind the money, the race, the class, everything, you know, the cultures, that these are just human beings and that many of us, we're going after the same things in different ways. The truth is that I wrote a novel about challenges, <laughs> about challenges like myself, uh, about by people and uh, people like myself are going through. And if people, if the novel, you know, was published, it doesn't take away the challenges. It doesn't take away the reality that there is inequality, there's racism, there's sexism, it doesn't take away that. I am still a black woman, you know, standing here, and I'll go out there and I'll still deal with the challenges of being a black woman, and I know what it's like to be working class. So I don't think we should use one story and say, oh, look at this, it happened. It's true, it happened. I am very grateful. I am very grateful. It's a privilege. Um, but I think that, 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 that the reality of what it's like, you know, to be working class in this country and to be black in this country, like which my novel in many ways, you know, talks about, is still there. It's still there. Whether or not I publish a novel, it's still there.